Frank holds a BA in Anthropology from Kenyon College and studied at the University of Seville in Spain her junior year, and she resides with her family, as I'm sure you all know, in Brooklyn, um, New York. So please, thank you so much, Naomi, for being here. Please welcome her up front. We're really excited to hear you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, so I'm going to be reading from Strength of Soul, as Melinda said. I'm going to be explaining my book's cover art, which was painted by my son Sebastian and designed, <laughs> um, and designed by my husband Adam. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll also be reading the quote that inspired my book's title, my dedication, preface and two chapters. So, without further ado, strength of soul. <laughs> Para Sebastián, and dedicated to my family, past, present, and future. Ever since my father died, as I have adjusted to life without his physical presence, the sun has shone in moments I have missed him most. I genuinely feel my father's presence in the sun, and it has always managed not only to bring me light, but to give me strength. Having my son paint this art symbolizes that he too is my light and my strength, and that bringing him into the world is the catalyst for this book. <clears throat> when someone, with the authority of a teacher say, describes the world and you are not in it, there is a moment of psychic disequilibrium, as if you looked into a mirror and saw nothing. Yet you know you exist, and others like you, that this is a game done with mirrors. It takes some strength of soul, and not just individual strength, but collective understanding to resist this void and to stand up, demanding to be seen and heard. Adrian Rich, Blood, Bread, and Poetry, Selected Prose, 1979 to 1985. Preface. When my son opened his eyes for the first time in December 2010, and my father's permanently closed in November 2011, I was thrust into a re-examination of my identity. I was now a mother and a fatherless daughter. My light-skinned, blonde, blue-green-eyed son reminded me in many ways of the beloved father I had lost. And as I adjusted to my new normal, I began to take stock of my history and of my future. As I took stock, I thought a great deal about the racism and erasure I had experienced my entire life as a bilingual, multi-ethnic, multi-citizenship individual living in the United States. The transformative experience of bringing my son into the world and saying goodbye to the father who had in part produced us both propelled me to truly examine systemic racism and its perpetuation. My son needs to see his story reflected in the printed word. It is only through seeing his family's complex history reflected that he will be able to see himself and others in totality. Our stories are not written on our faces. Chapter 13, Otherness. There is specificity to the curiosity and hostility my family experiences. There is also a subtlety. In high school, I have a clear memory of a classmate asking me what I am. I responded, I'm half Ecuadorian and half Jewish. She gave me a disbelieving look and with anger responded, that doesn't tell me anything. What color is Jewish? I was startled by both her words and her tone, but given my experience with such, inter with such interactions and my ability to think quickly, I matter-of-factly responded, what color is Ecuadorian? She was silenced as my response highlighted the ridiculousness of her question as well as the callousness of it. When that classmate asked me what I am, which in and of itself is an offensive question, she should have simply accepted my response. I know who I am, and yet, my response did not fit her notion of how one should self-define. She saw me, a brown-skinned, bilingual girl, whom she could not quite pinpoint, and so she approached me, not with openness and curiosity, but with anger and resentment. I have written about the teasing I experienced as a child, such as being called monkey lips. I am sadly beginning to observe a teasing of my son that I believe is rooted in our perceived otherness. Although when Sebastián is out in the world with Adam, or with his paternal family, and not with me, he is presumed to be white, the minute I show up, his complex truth is revealed. To be honest, it is revealed the minute he shares his name. 
But that alone is not enough to shock those around him. Even at his young age, children of the park will say, that's your mom? You're his mom? The narrative of skin color as definer and as equating similitude is so powerful that six-year-old and seven-year-old children have also internalized it. My son proudly states, yep. And I evenly say, I'm his mom. And will often place my face right next to Sebastian's so that the children asking will see our facial features, our whole faces, rather than our different coloring alone. The children will then often smile or chuckle and say, he does look like you, or you have the same mouth. Once they see past our different coloring, they see us. Nevertheless, Sebastian is arriving at an age where these intrusive questions or the disbelief we encounter upset him. He told me recently that when people do not believe I'm his mother, it bothers him because not only am I his mother, but we do look alike. I soothed him and explained that though I know it hurts and angers him, when people ask him that, it is about them, not about us. But so Sebastian is now coming home telling me of classmates who will tease him for how seamlessly he speaks Spanish. He'll tell me, they say, ooh, Sebastian, you think you're so smart. These interactions clearly upset him, and as his mother, they hurt and upset me too. And I know in my gut that some of it, if not all of it, have their roots in his difference. Sebastian, like me, exists in the middle, in the nuanced world of those who belong to more than one culture and to speak more than one language. In his case, however, because he's presumed to be white, his nuance is even more confusing and unsettling to others. The reactions we receive are not always hostile. They are sometimes sad and revealing of how powerful our history of colonization, white supremacy, and systemic racism is. I have observed that quite often when Latin Americans meet Sebastián, they are startled that his name is in Spanish. But even more so, they are startled to discover that he speaks Spanish fluently. Their instinct is to speak to him in English. And even after it's been established that he is also a Spanish speaker, they will comment on how good his Spanish is as if he were a foreigner who had studied and learned the language, as opposed to the native speaker that he is. Even if their English is not as fluent, they will address Sebastian in English. I am convinced that this has to do with his presumed whiteness. These fellow Latin Americans hear that his name is in Spanish, and they hear that he is a Spanish speaker, but they cannot reconcile that with his light brown hair, blue green eyes, and light skin. They see a white Americanito, little American, and to be American, you speak English, and you change your name to be more palatable to English-speaking ears. These interactions are also intricately connected to our perceived otherness, and the fact that we disrupt historical and cultural narratives. They also reveal internalized racism and white supremacy. The internalized racism and white supremacy do not only manifest in black and brown people, however. I have noticed how this internalization manifests in white people as well and it has deeply affected my interactions with them, particularly now in Sebastian in the world. When I was a new mother and adjusting to my role, I tried some different mommy and me type gatherings, but quickly learned not only how much my son and I stood apart, but how out of place I felt. I was assumed to be my son's nanny, and even after it was established that I was his mother, the conversations were so often offensive to me. I would say I'm half Ecuadorian, and a fellow mother would tell me about her nanny who was from Ecuador, as if that would be a point of connection. Or once it was established that I was bilingual, I would be told something about the nanny who speaks Spanish, or was once told I am fluent in vacation Spanish. Perhaps these women, <laughs> perhaps these women thought they were making comments that would put me at ease, make me realize how worldly and open they were, but they served to do the exact opposite. They alienated me even further, and I've come to realize that in some ways, there are few people with whom I can feel a true connection, particularly now that I am the brown mother of a son presumed to be white. Even now, years after Sebastian's birth, going to the park with him is emotionally and psychologically exhausting. I am one of the few brown faces who is not the nanny, in fact. And even with the other black and brown parents, I often feel a separation because Sebastian is presumed to be white. I've learned to bring a book with me to the park, especially now that Sebastian is older, and make it clear that I'm not very interested in taking part in any conversation. The parents I've connected with the most in our neighborhood parks are the parents who, like me, live between worlds and languages. These parents, though they may initially feel shocked or confused by my family, do not make me feel othered, and with them I can find true points of connection. And these are parents, 
who according to our American system of categorization and classification would be considered white, black, or brown. All of these experiences make me think of the passage my mother would quote to me from Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, 1991, page 40. Logan was accusing her of her mama, her grandmama, and her feelings. When Sebastian is older, I am sure I will teach him that quote, but in the meantime, it informs the lessons Adam and I are teaching him about never curtailing who he is to please other people. My family's perceived otherness is just that, someone else's perception. We will not be accused of being who we are. Chapter 15, Whiteness. Whiteness, as a concept and as a belief system, has been created over a long period of time, beginning in the late 1600s, in order to justify slavery and the notion of an inherent racial hierarchy, nor in 2014. White people were naturally superior, and black people, later to include all people of color, were naturally inferior. Despite modern science refuting race as biological, we continue to adhere to this belief system culturally. At the White Privilege Conference in April 2016, I decided to truly challenge whiteness by attending a white affinity group meeting. I chose to attend not because I have any wish to be perceived as white, but rather as an intentional challenge to white supremacy and systemic racism. One introductory exercise was to write our reason for being in the space of what we hoped to get out of it. I had written about my experience as a mother as succinctly as I could. When I spoke, I shared that if I were to accept an ideology of racial difference, I would create a divide between mother and son. I said, perhaps it's high time dark-skinned, multi-ethnic people like myself lay claim to their whiteness as well. I said, it is now clear to me that as a society, we not only perpetuate a racial divide, but we adhere to the most essential tenets of white supremacy and systemic racism. I am often told how lucky I am that my son is so light-skinned. I have been told this by white, brown, and black people alike. Racism and colorism within black and brown communities are so omnipresent that even people who are adamantly fighting against systemic racism and white supremacy will continue to perpetuate the ideologies at their base. I cringe every time I am told my son is lucky because lucky implies a number of things, all of them negative. It implies that I am then unlucky to have dark skin and features that hark back more clearly to Africa and to Asia. It implies that by virtue of my son's physical appearance, he is automatically entitled to a life of privilege and protection. It implies that because he is presumed to be white, he will not necessarily be harassed or worse killed by law enforcement officials. I would never deny that my son's presumed whiteness does in fact protect him in this society, but it is precisely that reality that needs to change. There is no other explanation for my son's automatic protection and privilege other than an elevation of whiteness and a devaluation of blackness and brownness. Despite knowing that my son's presumed whiteness protects him, I refuse to raise him to believe that that is acceptable. No one in this society should accept racist narratives that privilege and protect whiteness while simultaneously disenfranchising and criminalizing blackness and brownness. It is the acceptance of those narratives that gives white supremacy and systemic racism power they require to thrive. All of the truths about my son's privilege and protection lead directly to the seed of white supremacy and systemic racism, the creation of an ideology of racial difference and whiteness. My son should not be automatically protected by his skin color. The fact that he is, is the crux of our deeply racist and unjust society. My son is no more lucky to be light-skinned than I am unlucky to be dark-skinned. To perpetuate that narrative in the raising of our children is damaging, not only to their psyches, but to their ability to empathize and recognize the commonality of humanity. Resistance is what motivates me to challenge the rotten root of white supremacy and systemic racism. If I do not resist, I will relinquish agency in how I raise my son and how I wish for him to self-conceptualize. It will also allow for my own devaluation and erasure. The reactions that link good fortune with my son's physical appearance are reflective of internalized racism and the notion that the lighter you are, the more worthy you are. These concepts were introduced through colonization, slavery, oppression, and dominance. And the consequences of these concepts are essential to having been unfairly empowered or subjugated. 
Later in the evening, on the same day I joined the White Affinity Group meeting, people who had been in the room came up to speak with me. I remember one individual said to me, it is uncomfortable for me to be generalized as a white person. I really dislike being generalized. Another said to me that during the conference, she had been left feeling unbearably white and privileged. Some of them told me of their own dissonance associated with whiteness, given that either they themselves were immigrants or were the children or grandchildren of recent immigrants. They said how uncomfortable it is to know that by virtue of their physical appearance, they are privileged and are beneficiaries of white supremacy and systemic racism. Another said to me that she had never thought about what I had brought up, and it made her think of when people are misidentified. I realized in those brief interactions that perhaps there's a whole other approach to challenging systemic racism, an approach that does not require the acceptance and perpetuation of the fallacy of racial difference. My son is already receiving messages, which my husband and I are combating, about his supposed inherent superiority. I was once told by a shopkeeper in our neighborhood how clean Sebastian's skin is. He said it in Spanish, limpia, but the association is unmistakable. Lightness equates cleanliness, pureness, or holiness, and darkness equates being dirty, marred, or cursed. When the shopkeeper said that to me, I responded, su piel no es limpia, es clara, es no tiene nada que ver con la limpieza. His skin is not clean, it is light, it has nothing to do with cleanliness. We need to stop relaying these messages of inherent difference and of attaching value to skin color, whether covertly or overtly. As I learned in my conversations the evening of attending the White Affinity Group meeting, the dissonance many white people feel with whiteness is ammunition for challenging the language and ideology at the base of white supremacy and systemic racism. The scientist Bill Nye, 2013, once said, researchers have proven scientifically that humans are all one people. The color of our ancestor skin, and ultimately my skin or your skin, is a consequence of ultraviolet light, of latitude, and climate. We are one species. We have to work together. A statement like the one above is often scoffed at or dismissed in equity circles or even in conversation because it ostensibly denies the lived truth of systemic racism. I believe, however, that what Bill Nye says is crucial to both bringing the lived truth of systemic racism to light and to challenging that very system. The narrative and ideology of racial difference began with dehumanization, and that dehumanization continues. We truly are one human family, and perhaps in recognizing our shared humanity, rather than perpetuating superficial physical differences as immutable and automatic separators, we will be able to properly arm ourselves to combat white supremacy and systemic racism, and hopefully in time, 